We'll move on to another question uh, that I think is very important to consider whenever we are working with a wide variety of different resources and maybe trying some things a little bit outside of our comfort zones in some cases even. And the question is, how do you weed out the weeds, so to speak, whenever there's a lot of noise out there in terms of different types of resources, if this is something that my students are actually using or they're doing well with, or how do you decide if a resource just doesn't make the cut or how do you decide if something is good and it's something you want to keep around with you? And Wang Laoshi, let's start with you on that question. So how do you go through the material, weed out what's not working and decide what you're going to keep, what is good and working for you? Um, so if a website or tools that's developed for educators, uh, I tend to use uh, those first, um, you know, over, uh, you know, those uh, advertisement free, um, you know, tools or website. Because um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, free videos on YouTube and social media, but uh, they run a different business model. And oftentimes they, this business model uh, run a comp uh, a conflict has a conflict with uh, what we're trying to do, our educational purposes. Uh, so even those content is excellent and they are very well developed. But if the business model of the developer sets a conflict, I would weed them out. Uh, definitely, you don't want your student to learn a few sentences, but end up uh, you know spending a few hours on video games. Uh, you know, to reach the educational goal, I prefer to using the tools designed for uh, educators only. I can give you some examples. Uh, for example, uh, Duolingo has a non-educational version, right? And those are free. A lot of people use it. Um, like a lot of business people, so they they find think it's very handy. Um, but if how, how they uh, earn money is they run those, uh, you know, uh, commercials, right? And every few minutes, uh, if you want to reach the next level, you have to, you're forced to watch these commercials, right? And sometimes again and again and again. Uh, if you're using that kind of uh, type of, you know, tools for uh, your language class, uh, the problem is, um, you know, when you reach the, try to reach the next level, the students are forced to watch those video game commercials and then they end up get, you know, um, distracted from their learning, you know, goals and they end up, you know, playing those video games, right? And that's not what you want to run into. So, um, so uh, I try to, you know, kind of read out those uh, that has a pop-up, you know, uh, commercials. If you have to use uh, YouTube, uh, you know, there's a way to filter out, you know, the commercials before embedding the video into your uh, content management system. And you can kind of just uh, Google or YouTube, you know, um, how to filter out the commercials and there's videos to tell you how to do that. And there's a lot of videos and that uh, talking about that. So, so, um, uh, that's, you know, um, just from, you know, finding resources online and uh, what I find, you know, very useful. You do bring up a good point. A lot of those uh, free resources out there are actually just sales funnels. And we kind of have to be mindful about what we're sending our students to. So that's definitely a good way to kind of filter out what I'm going to keep versus what I will let go. Thank you for those insights. Uh, Walt Slaushi, we'll pass that question back to you. And this is, again, kind of talking about weeding out the weeds. There's so much information out there. There's a lot of it's noise. How do you decide what you want to keep versus what you want to let go? Oh, yeah. We have come so far from the days back when the Earth's crust was cooling when I was in college learning Chinese. And we had to go accost Chinese people riding the DC subway to try to get them to speak Chinese to us, you know. And now... Really, if you don't learn Chinese, it's because you haven't been on the internet. There's so much stuff there. Um, but as far as me as a CI teacher, I'm going to try to keep my students in bounds. In other words, I'm going to try to keep them developing the language that they have already got rather than trying to stretch it out. I want to go narrow and deep, lots of repetition, lots of different contexts with the same language in it. So same words, same structures. Um, so my first criterion is, is a resource going to facilitate correct input for them? So it could be oral, oral input, just listening or something like that, or it could be text, but hopefully with pronunciation linked to it. As a foreigner, I can tell you that if I read a text and there's no pronunciation linked to it, I'm dead in the water if I'm a learner. I mean, after 40 some years, I can usually limp along now, but still there are times I can't. So that's really important. But at the same time, I don't want my students to be having pinion on characters because these are foreign eyes right here. 
these eyes grew up with ABC. They did not grow up with Ding and whatever other radicals you want to name. So my students' eyes and mine will go to that pinion no matter what. We can't help it. Even if we don't want to, I can't help it. I just read the pinion. So I don't want to ever make them have to spend that energy to avoid that. Um, I want to make it so that they've read so much at things that are at or below their level that there's no point in using opinion. It's easier to just read the characters. That's what I'm hoping. Um, also, I want to give them resources that are appropriate to their level. An example is I use mdbg.com as a translator. It's a professional level, you know, very broad database type dictionary. But when you put a single word in there, you're going to get 26, 30, 50 entries. And that's not practical for a learner. It's, it's too much. And plus, you go off in all these rabbit holes where, oh, look, it also means, you know, a rare type of uh, sleigh bell produced during the late Qing dynasty or something. And they get all excited about this and go down a rabbit hole. So instead of that, I'm going to rec recommend something more like using Pleco, which is the best thing ever. I've had it ever since it was out on Palm Pilot. And a dictionary add-in like the Tuttle Learners Chinese English Dictionary, which has fabulous examples. They're very, very beginner-friendly examples. Um, so that's going to help them more with making sense of the language they're finding in there than perhaps a more general or a higher level dictionary. My I focus primarily on novices and intermediate levels. So I'm not teaching AP. It's, you know, AP teachers experiences are going to be different. Um, I love a resource that allows me to add my own lists or my own text uh, that the resource will then do all kinds of things with that. So I get you know, uh, what do they say, I, uh, right? I, I have to write one text and then I get a whole bunch of benefits from that text that they can use it in different ways. Um, because that way, you know, I'm not working so hard. Same thing when I'm looking for video clips, for example, if I'm going to picture talk a video clip using screenshots from it and then narrate it at the end when they've gotten the new language, I'm going to look for a clip that allows me to prep the same clip for three different levels of class. And that saves huge amounts of time in preparing visuals and things like that, while still allowing you to not only differentiate if you've got that heritage speaker in the class that needs a little more language to keep him happy, you know, or if you're in a higher level and you've got some kids that had a shakier foundation and need a little more support. I hope that made sense. It makes perfect sense. And I really love the idea of using the same content and just popping whatever the student needs, whatever the level that the groups are at, and then giving that scaffolding as well. I absolutely love that. That's definitely something to consider. Truly working smarter, not harder. Anything that we can do with that as educators, we want to leverage that for sure. Thank you. And the same question will pass to Peng Lao Shi. And the question again was, whenever you're working with resources with students, how do you kind of weed out the weeds, decide what you're going to keep, what you'll have them use versus the stuff that you're going to let go and kind of go by the wayside? Uh, yes, I think um, to the, the measurement will be effectiveness, right? Is it effective or is it not effective? Does it have a high return on investment of time and energy? Uh, but that question, I usually leave it to the students. Uh, because it truly depends on how they use the resources. Is it for language practice? Is it for, um, for example, to, to get uh, more authentic materials to, uh, for in, uh, language input? Or is it to uh, foster their interpersonal skills or intake of the language, for example, to um, use, um, was it Hello Talk or some of the apps students use for language partners? Um, and sometimes they use it for uh, uh, chat GPT, for example, for the quality output, uh, especially in my uh, intermediate and advanced level students, they say, okay, this is the essay I wrote, and uh, can you give me some feedback or can you give me an uh, enhanced version? So it depends on uh, what they use the uh, app or the resources for. Some students, especially in summertime or winter time, they use it just for leisure. And even between classes, they turn on the um, YouTube videos, they're dancing, then, uh, you know, uh, they are just uh, showing me or share, sharing with their classmates the music they are listening to. So I think um, the 
the return on investment really goes back to the purpose of using the resources. So it, uh, the individual students have to make that decision. So that's my two cents. I agree. And not every student is going to do well with this resource and another resource that another student despises might absolutely love that resource. So I love how it's a little bit more student driven. Fantastic. Thank you. And Jin Laoshi, we'll pass to you. And again, the question was talking about working with resources. How do you weed out the weeds, keep the content that's good and kind of decide what you'll let go of? Uh, thank you for the question. I have learned so much from, you know, uh, Lao Shiman. Um, I think I want to just share my personal journey. At the beginning, I just grabbed whatever I heard. You know, I saw a, uh, a post on, I'm talking about at the beginning of the Zoom year. I heard uh, an app, you know, on um, Twitter. I just, you know, oh, I need to try this. And then a teacher friend recommended another one. I just jumped to another one. But eventually, I just told myself, no, 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 this is too much. I'm overwhelming myself, and I'm going to overwhelm my students. So I think um, this is what I do. First, definitely, I'm going to ask around for recommendations from my teacher colleagues. So because, you know, we're in the same field. If they speak highly about an app, it, it's worthwhile to just check it out, right? And next one is, I think I'm going to try it myself because I think, um, you know, each language is different. There are certain apps might work well for certain languages, but might not work well for Chinese. And definitely the third criteria I have is I want to see how many, uh, how many communication modes this app can work on. So just say if I know I need one for presentational speaking, but can I have an app that can have multiple, you know, uh, activities belonging to multiple uh, modes? And I personally like um, an app called Story Jumper. Uh, number one is free. <laughs> Of course, we will always look for free apps, right? So number one is free. And number two, uh, it sounds like um, um, book creator, like presentation or writing app. Yes, it has that function. But at the same time, I figured out we can also use this app for interpretive and interpersonal. So I was really happy I used that a lot. And um, okay, and um, I think, if you don't mind, I want to, can I share screen just very quickly talking about um, some resources? My Please go ahead, absolutely. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, give me one second and here it is. Okay, so um, let's see. Okay, can you see my screen well? Yes, okay, so, uh, Chinese Language Association for Secondary and Elementary Schools uh, is a, a nation, uh, national uh, teachers association for K-12 teachers. And we have a YouTube channel. And actually the first video was posted on March 15, 2020. And so far we have already uploaded 116 videos. And I want to actually share this with you. If you come over here to the video, and um, oh, we have a lot, but look at the most popular one here. If I go through this, do you see how many different apps we're talking about here? From uh, um, Canvas to a Game Kit, Story, I talk about Story Jumper here. Think link and virtual um, classroom near part. It's just basically all the major uh, tech tools being used uh, for online teaching were introduced uh, in the channel. And if you come here, you can definitely take a look. And so in Story Jumper, when I introduced Story Jumper, uh, I share with the audience that, of course, you can use it as a um, presentational writing tool. But I think what I like the most is this uh, app allows students to do collaboration 
uh, say if one student is staying at his home and another student is staying at her home, they can still join this app and do a collaborative work project. I think that's really solved my problem because how do I group them together, put them together, you know, to work on one thing. And also, uh, of course, this app has a function to record. So I just designed one activity so students can say one student record on one slide, one slide or one frame and the other student uh, can come to and listen to the recording and then uh, record the answer on the next uh, slide or frame. So that's a, like interpersonal in a way. That was what I can find close enough to, you know, true interpersonal. And also for interpretive, I can upload a screenshot of a reading piece and give students comprehension questions and they can type out their answer on Story Jumper. So, for, I mean, this, um, this app was introduced actually by my Japanese teacher colleague, and I, I really, really like it. And back to your question, I went through a lot of apps and eventually I think I just cut down a lot of, you know, um, apps and focus on just a few more. And I think I'm right now I'm using uh, Adpostal for interpretive listening, <laughs> you know, reading and um, Seesaw is the one I use the most for presentational speaking. And I think uh, I still use Nearpod once in a while. Uh, another app I use a lot is Padlet. This is for students to share ideas and, you know, brainstorm and share ideas. And also you can do interpersonal uh, writing on that app. So I'm hoping I answered the question. Very much so. You did bring up a really good point about how we have to be mindful about quantity as well, because if we're using too many things, even if they're good, it can cause our students to get a little bit overwhelmed and that make, make them disengage, which we definitely want to avoid. 